Good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, I apologize for bearing this mask. Um, this, uh, this lecture tonight uh, uh, will be recorded. So please, if you have objections, then let us know. And uh, the talk uh, is being streamed. So um, students of L all over the world, they are all over the world will be able to follow the lecture and our colleagues and students in Vienna uh, as well. Uh, Al asked me not to be too long and I don't intend to be too long, but there are a few things I have to mention here. First of all, that it is not only a privilege to have Professor Reber here, but uh, it's the good fortune of uh, CU and uh, especially the history department uh, that, uh, that we have him uh, with us for so many decades. And uh, it is so important that uh, there is a university where there are different generations together and uh, then the students are able to listen to and, and meet somebody who was not only a contemporary and witness of major historical changes, but um, who was an analyst um, as a scholar reflecting on these momentous changes as well. Uh, not only momentous changes of history, but very important changes in the uh, historical profession, all sorts of theoretical and methodological changes of the past uh, 60 or almost 70 years, um, still L started his illustrious career. And he is now the doyen of Soviet history in the whole world, not only here and not only in the US, but, uh, but that's the case. Uh, and what you should know is that uh, he's not only a great scholar and uh, the author of numerous very important books, especially in the, in the last decade when uh, in this age, people usually slow down, but he decided to speed up and, uh, and published uh, several books in a row um, by very serious publishers, uh, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, Yale University Press. Just in the past two or three years, uh, two very important books, one, on storms over the Balkans during the Second World War. And the other one is a, a new study about Stalin. This was not his first book about Stalin. Stalin is a warlord. And uh, in the past decade, he published books on the borderlands, uh, not only the Soviet Union, but uh, a modern, early modern, even early modern Russian history as well. So we will have a a lecture and we are fortunate that we can be here. An American in Soviet and Russian archives, not just an American, but a reader in Soviet and Russian archives. Thank you, Al, for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ishvan. Uh, you know, it's just as much a privilege to speak at the archives here um, and have such a well-informed, distinguished audience. So I'm quite flattered. And I thank you for turning out. Uh, and for those who are uh, streaming somewhere, uh, I would like to also thank uh, Marsha Seifert for helping me enormously put together the uh, PowerPoint and to discuss many of these issues before I bring them here. Uh, very enlightening dinner conversations we have. Uh, <clears throat> so let's have the first slide. Um, unfortunately, I have to turn because I, I don't have one in front of me, uh, but uh, th this is a, the title is superimposed on a letter uh, uh, from, uh, the, from Ivan Aksakov the famous uh, Slavophil uh, from the uh, 
uh, archive that we will shortly discuss. Uh, the second slide, which should be up there now, uh, are the themes and variations that I will uh, discuss, not in order because uh, they don't fall in a natural order, but uh, in relationship to each archive and archive ex experience. So discovering faults in the totalitarian model, which was a result of work in the archives and uh, their um, uh, revelations uh, and my access, uh, reorganizing and relocating uh, the archives, uh, which was a, 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 a century and a half project in Russia to fit political aims, uh, then encompassing images and texts. Uh, numerous archives have photographs, collections, even paintings, uh, as well as texts, and they uh, provided a an introduction uh, to me, which had important results. Uh, providing information exchanges with Soviet historians. I uh, benefited enormously from the contacts, personal contacts that I had with Soviet historians as a result of my work in the archives. Uh, just to give you one yeah. example, no, I'll talk more about the personal aspects. Uh, four of them asked me to write, uh, to contribute to Feshris uh, that they uh, were uh, honored by their students and colleagues. And I was happy to do this. Uh, then uh, gaining access, the difficulties and opportunities which vary enormously, uh, then leading to the exploration of foreign private archives. I may not be able to t talk too much about this, but they led me to private archives in, in Paris and also in uh, the Marquis of Sol Salisbury's estate outside of London. Uh, then triggering new perspectives, uh, comparative history and long durée. That is, I began to see these the continuities when I did work in uh, the uh, archives, the pre-revolutionary period, and then in the uh, post, uh, in the uh, revolutionary period and in post-Soviet uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, I will talk about those two. And finally, opening the path to synthesis, which is part of this uh, 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 new perspectives on comparative history, uh, that I began to see the importance of using the archives as a jumping off point for making larger uh, generalizations about Russia uh, in, um, uh, in over the past several centuries. So let me turn now to the first slide um, which uh, is uh, one, first slide, yes, uh, oops, uh, dealing with the State Historical Museum. Uh, in 1956, I was one of the, thank you, uh, one of the uh, first hundred uh, Americans to enter the Soviet Union after uh, the death of Stalin uh, under a program of the Ford Foundation, uh, which paid for my first class, that was the only way you could go, uh, interest. And let me tell you, I've never lived so luxuriously uh, in the Soviet Union or Russia as I did those years with uh, caviar every day and, uh, and Georgian wines and so on provided free uh, to me. And then uh, uh, travel uh, within the Soviet Union uh, uh, as well. And um, finally, uh, the, uh, the collection of the manuscript uh, of the, uh, 
uh, of the uh, State Historical Museum, which was not a text man, but a visual, a, 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 uh, an archive of images. And we should now go to the next uh, slide, which is, I think, wooden, uh, wooden images of peasant Russia, and then pass to the slide after that, which is an example. Now I saw these images, uh, I saw these, these uh, images in, in the collection of the State Historical Museum, and I uh, wondered whether uh, they had any uh, photographs. Certainly, <laughs> they didn't have postcards uh, in those days in uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, and they said, yes, we, we have a collection. Would you like to look at it? So I said, yes, and I did. And I selected a number of items. And then I said, but I, you know, I don't know what else you have, but anything you have on the history of, uh, of peasant Russia, I uh, would like to see. They said, fine, we'll have it in two weeks. And I said, ah, I won't be here, uh, but perhaps I could have someone pick it up. And they said, yes, sure. Uh, and who will that be? Uh, so I, I said, well, I'll let you know. So I went back to the embassy and spoke to my good friend, Robert Herrick, commander, lieutenant commander in the American Navy, who was the naval attache. And we'd been in a seminar together. And I said, uh, would you go uh, and pick these up? And he said, well, sure, but you know, they're not going to give it to me. I said, well, see. Well, of course, they did give it to him, and I brought them, and then he mailed, mailed them to me. Uh, this is a short, uh, or, ju or just three examples, uh, <clears throat> through the diplomatic pouch. And it was my first indication of the receptivity of Russian archives to an American uh, at, the t at, at, the, at the height of the Cold War. Uh, and this immediately uh, raised questions in my mind about what's this totalitarian model that I have been taught in the United States. Uh, it, it seems to have some faults uh, or some uh, breaks in its uh, continuity or consistency. Uh, and uh, so I uh, then requested at the same meet, at the same visit, uh, a visit to the closed fund of the Tretyakovsky uh, uh, ga uh, gallery. Uh, amazing to me in the first place that they didn't rename it since it was named after one of Russia's greatest merchant capitalists uh, and uh, <clears throat> and a family that participated in the provisional government which was overthrown by the Bolsheviks. But, there it was, another survival of the past. And uh, so I heard from people in the embassy, look, if they're going to show you everything, then ask to see the closed funds. So I went there uh, to the gallery uh, and I asked to see it you know, with my translator uh, guide, which was always with me. And they said, fine. So I, in the basement of the Tretyakov gallery, we entered this tunnel and uh, dimly lit with the walls covered with stacks of paintings. And they, I would say, well, do you have anything by Kandinsky? Oh, yes, here. And they pull it out and hand it to me. Uh, I thought, I'm holding a priceless item uh, that uh, just un, uh, uh, astounding, unbelievable. So they kept showing me things, Malevich, Kandinsky, Chagall, and all <clears throat> down the line. And, and finally, I said to the curator, well, uh, this is a magnificent collection, but if you don't show it to the Russian public, maybe you'd like to sell it because in the West, people would just go wild. Maybe I didn't say it that way, but they would about this collection. And she looked at me and in that very stentorian Soviet voice said, someday the Soviet people will be ready to view this collection. So I didn't ask what ready was, but I 
suspected that when full-blown socialism came, uh, they would uh, uh, feel that the people were sufficiently inoculated against the past to see abstract art. But then, at the same time, it occurred to me there was a link between the peasant uh, designs and the abstract art. And then I did a little work and found that Kandinsky visited the north, Archangelsk in that area, the heart of peasant wood carving, and that he incorporated these into his work. And this sparked the idea of a link between the traditional and the modern, between the archaic and the abstract. Again, an element of continuity. Uh, and I, I, I wrote up a paper, but I never published it uh, because I wanted to do something with the folk epos same time, but that, that was just too ambitious, so I, I gave it up. But I did use it in class in my lectures on Russian culture. Now, the next slide uh, is another, is it another peasant? Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and the one after that, and you get some idea of these in, incredibly ornate and uh, embellishments of peasant huts. I mean, these are supposed to be downtrodden, uh, uh, illiterate, uh, ignorant people. Well, yeah, maybe, but they're also artists among them, great artists. All right, let's go on to the next one, which is the uh, Garf. Is, is that the next yes. one? Yeah, Garf. Garf, uh, it's changed its name several times. Uh, this is the modern version. I, I never worked in it, but I'm showing you that uh, archival buildings have become a source of pride uh, uh, since the fall of communism. Uh, and Garf contained uh, great uh, uh, collections. Uh, and uh, is this Garf? No. No, this is, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Rumiansev Museum of the Manuscript Division of the Lenn Library. So we'll wait on Garf. It's another archive. Uh, here's a wonderful 18th century building, beautiful. And it ha houses an extraordinary collection. How did I get into this? Uh, in 1958, I was one of the 17 first American uh, students to participate in the cultural exchange agreement uh, with the Soviet Union. And uh, um, as part of that exchange, I had to present a uh, Naochny plan, a scientific academic plan. And I had consulted with my uh, advisor at Columbia and he uh, suggested that I uh, apply for uh, a topic that involved working in the foreign ministry archives since he had worked in them in 1932. Well, it was a long time since 1932 and a lot had happened. So I ran up against a stone wall and in my uh, report on my research, I complained that I didn't have access to the archive. And after <clears throat> there was a, a small uh, reception, maybe that's too strong a word. And a, a, a historian came up to me. This was in the archive, this was in the department of capitalism and imperialism, as it was then called. Uh, this was Pyotr Andreevich Zajskovsky. Now he became uh, a legend in America. Uh, I like to say partly to my, <laughs> my uh, popularizing him, but only partly. Uh, and he said to me, uh, Mr. Reber, or Professor Reber, I don't know what he called me. Uh, uh, you you won't find much of interest in the foreign ministry archives that goes beyond the conventional diplomatic exchange. But if you want to get to the heart of Russian foreign policy, then you must go to the manuscript division of the Lenin Library. Uh, and so I did, and uh, I got the permission from my supervisor, a nice man, uh, Valery Ivanovich Babikin, and uh, I showed up. And they welcomed me like you know, some long lost 
uh, soul and provided me with some of the most extraordinary archival materials I ever encountered. And to investigate foreign policy, I selected the Katkov archive. Now, Katkov was the leading Russian journalist of the 19th century of the mass press and played a unofficial but very important role in the formation of foreign policy. Now, there were hundreds of letters here, maybe more than just hundreds, uh, but certainly uh, that many handwritten. And uh, they just kept supplying me. And finally, the archivist said, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get through all of this. And I said, no, unfortunately. She said, do you want us to microfilm it? And I said, what, the whole archive? And she said, yes. And they did. I thought, this is unbelievable. So I brought out this archive, which I then used, but I also gave just last year, part of it to the OAS archive here that I didn't use. And uh, part of it uh, I gave to one of uh, our MA students who was getting a PhD in America. Uh, and she wrote a brilliant dissertation on Katkov. But then the, the other result of this was I said, when I came back to the States at a briefing, listen, everybody's got to ask for Zainskovsky as uh, his supervisor. And so they did a whole set of, of historians who became famous in the United States, uh, like uh, uh, Dan Field and Richard Wartman and uh, 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 many others, because they worked with him. Uh, and we all thought he was such a great help that we proposed him for an honorary membership in the American Historical Association. And of course, they did accept him as a very prolific writer. But uh, after that, he was not allowed to travel. The price one had to pay. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the basis uh, of the collection and the manuscript division, I was able to develop uh, a theme on the uh, origins of the great reforms in the need to abolish serfdom in order to create a modern army after the Crimean defeat. Now that thesis has become uh, more or less uh, uh, controversial. Some have accepted it, others have not, but it was part of a book I published on the letters of Alexander II to Prince uh, Baryatinsky, uh, the Viceroy of the Caucasus. So uh, here uh, was uh, another example of archives being invaluable to me in developing a new interpretation of a key aspect of Russian culture. Uh, then, uh, as a result, again, of uh, these archives, I uh, was advised to, next time I went back, to work in Garf. Now we'll go to Garf. And as I said, a new building, the old one. And Garf was run in those days by a wonderful scholar, Miranenko. And he uh, uh, must have instructed his archivists to help me as much as they could. Well, yes, uh, when, uh, they provided me with a separate office. Uh, now, nobody else uh, enjoyed this privilege there ever. And then uh, as I read the letters of Al uh, Alexander II, uh, which were coming from a Khralilishche, which was right next to this office. So in one hour, I would get the documents, not a day, not two days, one hour. And then uh, every afternoon at four o'clock, they would serve me homemade chocolate cake and uh, tea. Now, you know, this doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, but it happened to me. And so on the basis of the uh, archive, I was able to 
uh, write my, uh, uh, I thought, one of the best books I have written, which is Merchants and Entrepreneurs in Imperial Russia. Uh, and that's the one that led me to foreign archives. Uh, and uh, it, again, uh, was drew me back into the social and economic history of Russia, of which foreign policy became a complement uh, rather than the dominant element. Uh, now, uh, in uh, 1990, uh, the uh, archives uh, were open to the Soviet period. Now, I had begun my PhD work in the, in the Soviet period, but there was no hope of getting into Soviet archives in the early 50s. Uh, so I wrote on foreign policy. Uh, but now there was an opportunity. They were opening in, a, in an expansive way to uh, reveal uh, aspects of Soviet life that had been hidden all these years. And by hidden, I mean some of the archives that I worked in in, uh, in uh, in the next slide, which was, is the party archive. Now they kept these wonderful bar reliefs. <laughs> what could they do? Uh, didn't want to demolish them. And they, uh, this, the party archive contained treasures from Stalin's personal secretariat uh, and his personal files uh, in a uh, a, in, in a remarkable way. And what I've done is to bring the uh, uh, archive guide, uh, which uh, was freely available, uh, special files for uh, uh, J.V. Stalin, materials from the Secretariat of the NKVD of the USSR 1944 to 53. Uh, so you can imagine what, uh, it, how exciting it was to see these materials. Now, I will only give you uh, uh, one uh, example, uh, and that uh, comes next. Uh, that is yes. uh, this. Yes, yes. This is the uh, request for files. Now, I had to make out a, uh, a uh, list of materials that I wanted. And what I was interested in was going back to the idea of foreign policy, uh, but through the international communist movement. And uh, so this Trebavania, this request, uh, shows a number of things. On the right-hand column, there are all these numbers. Now, those are Diela, those are files. Uh, or uh, um, uh, some, some people call them files, uh, within the uh, opus, which is 122. Uh, and uh, it may be too faint to see it here, but some of these are encircled in red. And then there's a list below, uh, which are those which I was allowed to see. So obviously I wasn't allowed to see everything, but you can see in the left-hand corner, the signatures of all the people who had to approve that I was getting this. Uh, and so uh, I uh, worked in these archives uh, for uh, quite a while and was able to produce a material for, for short monographs. And perhaps the most interesting and important one was the uh, uh, Zdanov archive, which were the papers of Zdanov when he was uh, a, uh, ma uh, the major uh, commissar for uh, the uh, Allied Commission in Finland. Uh, but there were others, and I so I did one on Finland, I did one on uh, Hungary, I did one on, uh, on uh, Romania, and I was planning to put them all together in a book on uh, new versions of the Cold War, uh, showing how in each one of these states, the Soviet approach, Stalin's approach differed according uh, to the circumstances 
that he encountered. Uh, so uh, the next slide uh, is uh, that I return to Stalin as a leader, as a major figure. And I came across a file uh, in uh, the party archive, uh, which was entitled the Family Album of the Aleluyev Family. Now, Stalin married into this family and uh, it was extraordinary to see photographs uh, of the, in, what does amount to the intimate life, uh, if only in portraits, uh, of this of this marriage. Uh, so uh, the first one I think is uh, Olga. Uh, yes, Olga Yevgenia Alleluyeva and his mother-in-law. And the second one is his wife when she was about 16 when he first met her. Now, what struck me, uh, and uh, this may be my American, I don't know, racist bias, but uh, Olga did not look like a Russian. I mean, she had darker coloring and uh, uh, I found out she was Georgian. And uh, she had married a Russian worker who Stalin knew uh, in back in Tbilisi days in Georgia. Uh, all the, and, and the, I began to see more and more the Georgian collection, connection. He married uh, uh, Natalia, who was uh, uh, partly Georgian. I think this shows up here. And uh, then I began to explore uh, in his uh, private archive uh, the basis for the documents that furnished the editors of his complete collection of, uh, uh, of Stalin that were published after the war from 46 on. And lo and behold, what I discovered, uh, uh, per perhaps not everybody's conviction, is that Stalin's Georgian roots were very deep and not influenced, not only influenced his personal trajectory uh, from Georgia to Russia, but influenced the way in which he perceived Russia's relations with the nationalities and how this could be regulated uh, and ultimately transformed. Now, most historians, beginning with Robert Tucker, whom I, I knew and um, greatly respected, uh, thought that Russia, that uh, Stalin had become completely Russified. Well, I argue no. And I traced through this family uh, relationship. First of all, when he came back from exile in Siberia, he took refuge in Petersburg in 19, uh, in the summer, uh, spring and summer of 1917 with this Georgian oriented family and uh, Olga uh, ran a Georgian, uh, a Georgian household. Uh, he also had, of course, through his first marriage with a pure Russian, uh, the connections with his Svanidja family, lots of relations, including a son uh, whom he disowned uh, because uh, uh, his, his, his mother died in, in birth. He blamed the son, Ivan, uh, and that's a tragic story, which I, I won't go into, but uh, the connections with Georgia, he, and then I realized when I went back to look at his collective works that he had published oh, exclusively in Georgian until he was 28 years of old, age, 28 years of age. Now we know everybody said uh, in Russia, they knew you could hear it, and I had a recording of Stalin giving a speech once uh, that he spoke with a strong accent and he had a formulation of Russian, which as numerous uh, observers mentioned, including Trotsky, of course, he would, uh, wasn't quite Russian, wasn't quite Russian. Uh, and, and then this involved Stalin in a whole series of connections 
with Georgia, ending, of course, with both a massacre of those close to him in the Svanidja family, as if he were avenging himself against too deep an association with Georgia, because he needed to pose as someone who had he learned his Marxism-Leninism through Russia and achieved political status through his trajectory from Georgia and from the bond of the uh, Georgian Mensheviks to true Russian Bolshevism. And then one of the last works that he ever completed was the linguistic controversy in which he denounced a uh, uh, Nicholas Marr, who was a, a Georgian a philologist, for his attempt to identify a Georgian uh, a, 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 as, as a class phenomenon that would disappear. And Stalin said, no, language does not belong in the class structure. Language is supra class. And all languages may disappear someday, but it will be far in the future, and it won't be Russian, and it won't be German. It will be something unique under communism. So this led me then into a reconsideration of Stalin's whole policy toward the uh, nationalities. Now, I agree with Terry Martin that uh, the, uh, in his famous work, that the Soviet leadership, well, Stalin, uh, changed his mind on emphasizing the role of Russian in, uh, in uh, Soviet society. He switched from his attack on great Russian chauvinism, which he identified with Russification under the Tsars uh, uh, to a emphasis uh, upon the importance of local languages within the great Russian context. But he never imposed Russian uh, on the school systems, the you know, elementary school systems uh, of the nationalities. Moreover, if you connect this with foreign policy, with my studies of the communist parties in the borderlands, uh, in the periphery, then I came up with a new interpretation, I think, of the role of borderlands frontiers in Russian history from the days of Muscovy down to, well, one would say the present, since it's still going on. Uh, so I, I, I want to emphasize again the fact that the archives provided me with these intellectual stimulation, with these uh, impulses to explore farther, not to be satisfied with, well, I uh, have established the factual basis for this particular narrative that goes beyond that. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm greatly uh, appreciative to the Russian archivists and my colleagues in the Soviet Union uh, and in the post-Soviet period uh, who helped me uh, enormously and couldn't have done it without them. Uh, and as a result, I would have to say that the recent developments, uh, uh, and I don't mean just the war, but I mean the great deterioration of uh, Russo-American relations uh, which has its own uh, explanatory uh, complexities, uh, has at times almost plunged me in despair. But fortunately, I still have those archives from the old days, from 50 years ago, and I am now working on a book called The Search for Equilibrium, uh, which is uh, an attempt again to find in the era of the great reforms, not just a struggle between liberals and conservatives, but an attempt of key figures 
in, uh, in, the Soviet, in the Russian government to find some balance between the contending social elements in Russia, particularly nobility and peasantry, uh, and between the Soviet, uh, between Russia and the peoples of the borderlands, Finland, the Baltic states, Ukraine, Caucasus, Central Asia. And though that connection uh, sheds for me uh, a illuminating light uh, on the question of what do reforms try to do in Russia? Well, I think they try to reconcile these persistent factors, as I've called them in another essay, which exist. Yes, there's change over time. Yes, the emphasis shifts, but the archives speak to me uh, in this way. And I uh, continue hoping that I have enough time to finish, uh, but uh, that too is problematic. Uh, so I'm optimistic, but not about what's happening there. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, or if you want me to pursue some uh, aspect that I mentioned but couldn't develop, fine. Thank you very much, Al. Um, it would be irresponsible to promise that uh, from now on, every researcher who comes here will get hot chocolate and cakes at four o'clock. But we will try our best next time you come, whenever you come, we will try to have the hot chocolate, if not the caviar, but at least, at least cakes. Um, thank you very much. I, I'm but, sorry, I forgot the last slide. Yes, we saw it. Did you see it on yes. Stalin and a Turkmen? Yeah. That's unique. I've never seen that anywhere else uh, in this family album. Uh, let, let me, can I say something yeah. before uh, the first question? Um, we are in an archive and uh, we have been struggling with uh, the deteriorating trust in archives, in archival institutions, in public collections in general, in institutions in general, including archives, and uh, documents that hold historical facts in the archives. Um, and um, you talked about your experiences in the archive and how you could build on the information you gained from those historical documents. So my question is, what would you suggest to us? How should we try, not only us, but um, our contemporaries to rebuild credibility, to rebuild trust in the archives, in the world where it seems that historical facts do not count in public debates? I, before I answer, I'd like to make the archives a present, uh, which is the uh, guide right. to the, uh, to the to contemporary yes. recent history of, yes. of Russia. Um, trust, well, <laughs> trust seems to be uh, in you. short supply uh, in, uh, in, in general uh, with a narrative with individual historians. I would say that, sure, you have to ex adopt a critical attitude toward who put together the archives, why were they put together, why were they organized in the way that they were, why did that organization change, why did the names of archives change. Uh, now, I could go through and give you a list of all the changes in the names of Garf since 1861, uh, and there are five. So the name itself is indicative of a shifting 
emphasis of what the archive is supposed to tell you. So you have to resist the way in which it's presented, and then you have to examine uh, where these archives were obtained and under what circumstances. I give you just one example in the Stalin archive. Uh, the uh, a number of there were several Russian historians who were preparing a publication of uh, on st documents concerning Stalin's uh, early years and. Uh, he was still alive, uh, so he had to pass on this. But the fact that he did pass uh, is already an indication that uh, this was something that he wanted known. Uh, therefore, it probably was trustworthy uh, because it wasn't invented. But when they tried to publish a second collection, extraordinary, the secretariat sent to the editors of the first collection, a Stalin still alive, the secretariat of the Central Committee sent these documents to these two men. This is a chance to publish again. And they, uh, uh, they were first examined by the head of the archive who said, oh, we can't publish these. Uh, they're, they're just a mess, in effect. And so this second collection was never published, though it had the authority behind it in the Central Committee. What does that mean? Well, <laughs> it leaves it up to you uh, to determine the answer to that, uh, but as far as the uh, trustworthiness of the imperial archives, uh, since many of them are handwritten uh, in uh, by the individuals uh, who are, are, uh, are involved, it, it's hard to deny these are legitimate. Uh, handwriting is a real problem, though. Uh, just give you a quick example. Uh, back to uh, the manuscript division, I was working on uh, the role of railroads in formation of foreign policy. And uh, one of the key figures was Baron Delvig, uh, who uh, was a uh, Baltic German uh, who wrote uh, these long uh, letters uh, to Chizhov who was a Russian entrepreneur, an extraordinary man uh, in his own right, in his inimitable handwriting. Now, he was a Baltic German, so he his first uh, handwritten, uh, I mean, his first uh, introduction to handwritten, to, to handwriting was German. And that was imposed on his uh, original language is German, and he's writing in Russian, and it was a nightmare. I mean, I, I said, I, I can't make this out. So I went to the archivist, and she said, oh, yes, uh, so we'll, we'll sit together and puzzle it out. So she spent hours with me going over these letters in order that I, and I still have her handwritten uh, Russian under the, uh, the scri scribble of Baron Delvey uh, so that I can even today read these uh, uh, very rapidly uh, without problems. Again, archivists today are going to sit down and puzzle out handwriting for you? Now, I was fortunate. I was there, as they say, at the beginning. Okay, questions? Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk and for the spoken memoir uh, that, that you uh, provided us. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? 
I can hear you, yeah. yes. Um, with, so I've been researching uh, the history of these cultural exchanges between the US and Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe. And one question or one issue that always comes up is the involvement of the uh, intelligence agencies or the secret services or the state security um, because there were some Americans who were arrested in the, the Soviet Union on, on charges of being spies. And then, then we have accounts that some of the, the early Soviet participants in the uh, American uh, part of this exchange were uh, KGB officers. Did you have any experience with these agencies or you, your colleagues? Or can you tell us something about this or, or you were lucky to <laughs> not have such. Well, yeah, I have plenty of stories. I don't know where to start. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the reasons that I sailed through all those years uh, without uh, being either uh, uh, contacted by Soviet security uh, agencies uh, or uh, uh, or prevented from visiting the Soviet Union, uh, or uh, I mean, even when I was denied access, uh, I wasn't accused of trying to uh, well uh, to uh, conduct intelligence. With one funny example, I'll give in a moment. Uh, but uh, yes, there were Americans uh, who were arrested. Uh, the famous uh, Frederick Barkhorn case, a political scientist at Yale. Uh, but Fred, Fred was a so street sociologist. He wasn't working in written tech. He was interviewing people on the streets. Now, this, I, this was not a wise thing to do. So he was arrested. And President Kennedy had to intervene and get him freed. Uh, this touched off a great controversy uh, among us uh, who were members of the Inter-University Committee on Travel Grants. And uh, I remember Richard Pipes uh, at Harvard, who's a hardliner, uh, saying, well, we should cut the exchange, abolish it. Uh, and uh, he said, anyway, you can write as good a dissertation in a Widener Library in Harvard as you can with the archives. <laughs> no, Richard, you can't. And the problem was that you made lots of mistakes because you didn't have access and wouldn't work in the archives. And that many of your students resented this and worked with Leo Hameson at Columbia uh, instead, who had superb access to the archives. Okay, so other Russian historians like Martin Malia uh, contacted dissidents. Uh, now, again, not the smartest thing to do uh, if you want to continue to enter the Soviet Union. So he was blocked and couldn't go, couldn't go back uh, <coughs> to the Soviet Union. Um, as for uh, contact with other American historians, yes. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my, good friends and a participant in the ex cultural exchange, uh, Tom Riha, who was Czech in origin. I don't know why they let him in in the first place, but they did. And then uh, he wanted to work in the Milukov archives. And at this uh, confrontation with the KGB chief, uh, he said, oh, well, we're revising, the, uh, revamping. Marimont, oh, that famous word in Russia. Uh, we are uh, revamping, uh, the repairing the archive. Uh, and so uh, a week later, a couple of weeks later, uh, two men showed up at Tom's uh, room in the Moscow State uh, uh, University dormitory. And uh, they said, in effect, listen, Riha, you want to get access to the Milukov archive, that's done very easily. Uh, now, all we need is something in exchange. And what we need is uh, a uh, uh, innocent report 
uh, the activities of your fellow students. So all you have to do is to tell us what they're doing daily. And Tom said no, at least that's what he told me. Uh, and so he never got access. Years later, he married a Russian emigre, uh, uh, a, sorry, he married a Czech girl in order to save her from having to go back to Prague after the extension of her visa in the United States. He didn't really love her, but he did this as a gallantry. He was a very gallant guy. Uh, and then the marriage began to get in trouble when he took as a mistress a Russian emigre uh, who uh, was known as the general uh, in, uh, in social circles. And apparently she either corrupted him uh, or compromised him or something. The marriage broke up and uh, in a scandalous and almost violent way, uh, indeed violent way, and then Tom disappeared. He was never found. Now, what happened? Well, uh, the FBI launched an investigation. They couldn't find anything. Uh, journalists pursued the issue, couldn't find anything. But we don't know. Uh, did the Russians send spies over? Of course. In fact, the guy who was sent over um, from Moscow say to match me at Columbia was a very successful spy. A young guy, he had good English, I was strongly uh, accented. He was enormously popular, popu popular in, in, in Columbia. Uh, and uh, he was elected uh, by the, the students uh, to be a member of the, of, the, of the Council of Students at Columbia University. He was a spy. He became a lieutenant general in the KGB. But then he defected and wrote his memoirs, which told the whole story of his involvement. And I reviewed it in a Philadelphia newspaper. Uh, so, <laughs> way these things turn. Uh, was I, well, so I said there was one exception to my being contacted. Uh, I was called to the phone from my room in the Moscow uh, State Dormitory, uh, at, at common room, <clears throat> the common phone, phone, and someone said that, that someone wants to speak to you. And I said, well, who is it? I don't, I said, oh, someone. So uh, a, uh, a voice came on, a woman's voice, and said, uh, uh, Burgess would like to meet you, Guy Burgess. He was the super British spy uh, who defected to Soviet Union. Uh, but as, and I said, well, I, who are you? What, who, what is this coming from? And so as we began to talk, I noticed she was hesitant and every so once in a while would half cover the, the, uh, uh, the receiver and be, speak to someone, a male voice. I thought, this is pretty clumsy. So uh, I said, uh, no, I, I'm not interested. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for calling. That was the end of it. So uh, there are currents and subcurrents and countercurrents, and I wasn't certainly aware of uh, the overwhelming number. Uh, there were uh, there were attempts, uh, apparently, uh, or fears that certain contacts would lead to compromises, a young American, the first year of the exchange, 
uh, was dating a Russian girl and she was very, very knowledgeable. Uh, so this became known to the heads of the committee in the United States of professors and they recalled him. Uh, so we don't know, there was no evidence that he in fact was compromising anybody, but there was the fear. So that's a long answer to your question, but I, I don't even pretend to, uh, to go believe, below the surface uh, uh, on, that, on that issue. And you can't see, but behind you, there are quite a few of our colleagues and your former students who are listening and watching you. Perhaps uh, there are some among the audience online who would also like to ask questions or make comments. Surely I haven't exhausted the topic. No. Huh? Anyone online? Yannick? May I? Sure, please. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Al. Um, hey. Yeah, I'm yeah, from, from Vienna. Um, sorry, sorry, my voice is a little bit off. I have a very brief question. What is your take on the current situation of doing work in archives in the Russian Federation? And do you think any comparison to the time period that you were talking about um, makes any sense um, when we look at what's happening today and to and the implications for the scholarship, the ramifications. Well, the latest information I have is of yesterday uh, from uh, uh, from a source that I will not identify, but but I will say is uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, about the situation and uh, uh, and about the CEU. Uh, and uh, he says that uh, there is uh, open access to anyone who uh, can provide documents from uh, his or her uh, institution, uh, except for any foreigners uh, who have uh, Make clear their position on the war uh, in uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, and who will not, in all probability, even get access uh, to uh, to Russia, uh, who will be denied a visa. Uh, and uh, I know that, on the other hand, that some of our former students are still working in archives in Russia uh, uh, without any visible interference. I don't know how long that will last uh, since CEU has been denounced uh, by uh, the Russian government for its uh, stand uh, on, on Ukraine. Uh, uh, but uh, the Russian government has never been the most efficient in the world, I must say. And there has always been some as I say, faults, some uh, slips, some breaks in uh, what is uh, policy uh, at any one time. Uh, so uh, I, uh, uh, I think that uh, the situation is, shall we say, in flux. More? Other questions? Oksana. Thank you very much, sir. It's really uh, amazing to hear these firsthand stories from the 1950s and 60s. And I was wondering, you were very lucky in the archives, as you were mentioning, in terms of access and friendly relations you build up. Uh, but beyond the archives, did you also have connections or meetings or discussions with the historians of your generation at the time? And what were the, what were your first thoughts when you were coming as first as a student and then as a um, professor? Were you feeling that you were part of the same 
discourse of the same interpretative frameworks or were there already big ruptures there and, and big differences in terms of the, you know, not just the interpretation of the primary sources, but also the secondary sources that you were reading and yeah. factoring in? Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> of course, uh, I was never, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was never a Marxist. Uh, I, uh, that's what you had to say the McCarthy hearings, uh, which I wasn't at. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> yes, of course, there were great interpretive differences. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, I reviewed their books, uh, gave full credit to scholarly achievements, but also I criticized when I thought the interpretation was distorted. Uh, uh, when I presented my findings on uh, in '66 on the uh, origins of the emancipation, uh, they listened uh, attentively, sort of, uh, and then a woman came up afterwards. Uh, I mean, woman historian. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of women historians, uh, which I admired in those days. It wasn't true in America. Uh, and she said, please give full credit to the fear of revolution, of a revolutionary upheaval in the countryside. And I said, well, yeah, I was there, but I, I don't think that it was uh, primary. Uh, and I explained why. Uh, but it was a request uh, to give their interpretation, which was, it was a revolutionary situation after the Crimean War, and they res the government responded to that situation. And I, I had taken issue with it, and uh, they, uh, they didn't accept it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there were times when we seemed uh, to have a meeting of minds. Uh, of course, that only surfaced after, uh, after the fall of communism. And I remember a conference which was uh, held uh, um, at the University of Pennsylvania, in which we invited uh, some Soviet, histo uh, some Russian historians, among them the beloved uh, Larissa Zakharova. Oh, I just thought she was a fabulous historian. She was a student of Zajkovsky and absorbed so much of his learning, his archival mastery, wrote a great book on the emancipation uh, as well as uh, several other books. And uh, we had submitted our papers beforehand to circulate. Uh, and uh, so uh, when we first met, her face illuminated and she said, we are on the same track. <laughs> I thought, oh yes, we're both students of Fyodor Andreevich. Uh, we, we owe a great deal to him. Uh, well, of course, uh, there, were, uh, there were great differences and uh, the, uh, the, but you see, there was a toleration there of, uh, of the uh, Americans uh, uh, over uh, until, well, until early Putin, uh, though even, even later, uh, of their interpretation. But of course, it shifted under Putin from Marxism-Leninism to supra Russian nationalism. And so again, uh, those of us in the West found ourselves in odds, except for that brief period uh, between uh, the fall and the rise, as it were, uh, when, uh, when the Russian historians were publishing madly archival documents, uh, which helped us uh, develop new interpretations uh, as they were in develop, developing new interpretations of Stalin and Stalinism. Uh, now, uh, 
Stalin is barely mentioned uh, in, uh, in, in, in the historiography. Uh, they don't know what to do with him. The revolution also mentioned but what is taken first rank in the historiographical idealization is the Second World War, uh, which, of course, as I've tried to point out, uh, the translation of is not the Great Patriotic War. That's not a correct translation. Correct translation is the Great Fatherland War. Russian word patriotichesky, doesn't that, that is, it's a foreigner's uh, and uh, nobody uses it there to define the war. Uh, no, it, and more and more, even this, the Second World War is not uh, being used. It's, it's the Great Fatherland War, with Russia standing alone. Uh, and the uh, the uh, the implication there is uh, a very interesting one because it requires a new access and publication of new archives, provincial archives, which are now being published uh, uh, under the re recurrent title to Tobolsk Province in the Great Fatherland. Tver province in the Great Fatherland War. Da, 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 da. Uh, so now it's it's seeping down, uh, not just at the net, but this is this is among the people who are recognized or is said to recognize or instructed to recognize that this is the great moment. This is the great moment in Russian history, uh, and so. Uh, I I would say yes, it was a great moment. I, I mean, I'm I'm the last one to deny that uh, because I I know that without without the Eastern Front, if Stalin had made a separate peace with Hitler, uh, and uh, as Lenin did with uh, uh, the Kaiser in 1918, uh, then uh, the whole bulk of the Wehrmacht, and that was the majority, uh, 130 divisions would have moved to the West and into North Africa. And what that would have meant for the Western alliance is rather terrifying to imagine. But, but there's always a but. Uh, exclusive uh, 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 in exclusive you divide an exclusive event no there were others many others uh, that, uh, okay other questions yes please Thank you very much, Professor Riva. I would have a very just a simple question. Um, how did you feel about going suddenly to? Uh, Sorry. How did you feel about suddenly the sudden openness? Didn't you feel somehow suspicious about being able to really be so so welcomed that everything was open, accessible? Um, how how was the atmosphere in general? So how would I have to imagine? At this moment in time when things were closed and suddenly extremely open. Um, how, how, how did scientists deal with this? So was it as open as, it, as, as you recounted? Because you say it's, it was a very easy way to, to, to approach everybody. But on the other hand, you just came from a context in which everything was closed. So what, what kind of uh, experience was it to have this sudden openness for scientists? And didn't you think that there were political, um, let's say, um, ideas behind that, that triggered this openness. So isn't there a double reading that one needs to, to have for this openness, for the sudden openness? Well, Thank of you. course, uh, as I said, there, the uh, access and the organization uh, of the archives 
will <clears throat> take place within a political context. And there's no question that after 1991 uh, and the opening of the of the uh, Soviet archives, uh, the political intention was to further the uh, condemnation of Stalinism and everything it stood for uh, and to uh, emphasize uh, the uh, horrors uh, of the gulag uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so uh, this 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 was absolutely uh, the case, and the uh, uh, whatever access, uh, whatever changes have taken place in access also reflect, as I tried to indicate, this new uh, uh, em emphasis uh, on uh, on Russian nationalism. Now I I don't. The Russian archives are enormous. And uh, I, I don't think anyone has a full understanding of their extent. Uh, and there are certainly large uncovered uh, documents. Now, for example, three years ago, two years ago, uh, Putin passed a law on uh, the new, the end, what was it? The end of the uh, limit, uh, what's the end of the limitation uh, of uh, access. And what this referred to was the sudden openness of hundreds of documents uh, on, uh, on the Holocaust. And particularly, where it took place in the Baltic states and in Ukraine. Oh, what the obvious political intent is, of course, to uh, defame and uh, uh, this uh, and de uh, institutionalize these states by blaming them for being acolytes as associates of Nazism. Now, we already know, I mean, I, I published an article called Civil War in the Soviet Union, uh, which drew on archives. And we already know that there were uh, uh, SS units drawn from the Estonian population. Uh, we know that there were large numbers of Ukrainian guards uh, at the at Auschwitz and uh, uh, other camps. Uh, we know that uh, in the beginning, uh, there was that uh, in the beginning, during uh, the war, uh, that uh, the organiz the uh, OUN, the, uh, uh, the uh, underground uh, Ukrainian organization of Bandera uh, fought both the Soviet Union, Soviet army, and the Polish underground army, which is often not mentioned, but that was the real, that was the real fight between the Poles and the Ukrainians uh, <clears throat> during, uh, during the late war years uh, for control over Podolia. Uh, so uh, the, the, the manipulation of archives for political reasons uh, goes on. And uh, I'm not in any way uh, uh, suggesting that uh, that this, uh, that these revelations uh, do not have a political intent. But if you take that into consideration and you compare the documents with uh, memoirs uh, with uh, uh, published correspondence of uh, the leadership uh, uh, and with uh, archives in the West, then you, you can pretty much tell which are uh, fabrications. Uh, it's, of course, more difficult to tell uh, 
what specific publications are intended uh, to uh, act as a influence uh, on, on scholarship. Because your lecture is uh, recorded, uh, let me make use of this opportunity uh, to say something for the record, which is marginally related to uh, Soviet archives. When uh, the first East and Central European countries became members of NATO, in 1997, I wrote a letter to the Secretary General of NATO, um, Andras Mink is here and uh, he can testify. And I suggested to him that NATO should open up its archives um, with a 30 years time limit from the beginning. And uh, in exchange, it would be great if the archive of the of the Warsaw Pact could also be made public. And then I was invited to a meeting. NATO decided to set up an archival commission and uh, they invited the director generals of the East and Central European Archives plus the director general of the Rus Archiv to Brussels. And I was also invited to that meeting. I had to wait more than five hours outside the meeting room. And then I was let in. And uh, I was asked to uh, repeat my suggestion in front of that audience, which I did. Um, there were some uh, directors there, most prominently the then director of the Hungarian National Archive. It turned out that he had been a police informer before and later on, he became the, uh, the chair of the Imre Noy Foundation to preserve the memory of the executed prime minister of the 56th revolution, uh, which he helped to defeat at that time. Um, but there was the director of the Rus Archiv who said that, that we don't know where the archive of the Warsaw Pact could be found. It disappeared. Um, there is a chance that it is somewhere in Sofia. Nobody knew why exactly in Sofia. Um, but uh, then the Deputy Secretary General of NATO who led that meeting uh, said that in that case, we can't do anything and we, we can't open up our archives uh, if there is nothing in exchange. And this is how it, it remained. So this is marginally connected to Soviet archives. But thank you very, very much for this, uh, for this lecture and uh, for allowing us to look back through your eyes and experiences to that uh, world which gone. And I would like to invite you for a small reception outside where we can continue the conversation. And I hope that we will continue this for very long years to come. Thank you very much, Al.